Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm Scott Meyer with Artist Network, and this is Drawing Together. If you are new, you're going to want to know that this is all about us getting together to draw together because it's the grind of the work and of the the work that we do as artists that allow us to grow. And, the, and we keep pushing things. We keep moving forward by giving us ourselves kind of particular challenges so that we grow in specific ways. And so um, you'll find a link to the reference image below, uh, and I will be walking through this project, but I would love to hear your own thoughts on your process, what materials you might be using, ask any questions you have for either me or anybody else in the, the viewing audience. Um, any comments, questions, thoughts about drawing are always welcome. So this is a time for us just to take time from our busy lives so that we can draw and just keep moving forward. So let's take a look at the project. I first also want to mention, I apologize for the uh, the confusion with the time. That was my mistake. I, um, I was on the East Coast when I set it up and my computer was had adjusted to the time zone and I had totally forgotten. And so it ended up showing up at 11 instead of one, my time, which is three your time. So I'm out in Colorado where it has been nice and cold, cold for a spring day. And I apologize for any weather concerns you might all be having. So, um, all right, let's get to it. I'm going to switch down to the overhead. This is what we're working on today. This is my preparatory sketch. Um, I worked on this tan tone paper. This is actually from the Soho sketch pad. I really like this um, tanned paper uh, that that uh, Jerry's has put together here. It's a really interesting surface. Um, so I worked on this tan tone paper using graphite and white charcoal, just kind of experimenting with some approaches and some, some techniques. Uh, so feel free if you have some, uh, uh, you know, an equivalent tan toned paper that you want to work with, or if you just want to work on regular white paper. Again, this isn't necessarily just, um, you have to match every material that I have. So feel free to draw along with any materials you do have, because a lot of what I cover will be applicable to most mediums. So, all right, so that's the paper I'm working with. Now, I, I cut mine out of the book and I taped it down because it it, uh, it just helps. It's a little bit easier for the, for the camera above there to capture everything. Um, for the graphite, I, I have this graphite stick that I'll try. Um, you know, this is a 4B. Um, and then if you just have a variety of uh, hardnesses of your graphite. What do I have here? I have a 5B, a B, and then this extra black, this general. So these are the Cezanne pencils that I really like. They're nice and soft. Um, so B being my hardest, and then I have a 5B, which is quite soft, and then this extra black, which should just get us even darker marks, plus a general's pencil, a white charcoal that I'll be using for some of those light areas. Uh, now, for blending, I was just in, in Orlando for uh, a trade convention called NAMTA. So it's all it's art material companies that are there, and they're showing products to retailers. And it's pretty awesome to see how much work goes into just providing us all, you know, practicing artists, the materials that we need. It's, it's an awesome industry to be a part of. While I was there, though, um, I came across these these uh, Dynasty IPC small round blend brushes. I actually have a few different sizes of them. I haven't really used them before, but I'm gonna give them a try. I tried them with some charcoal and it was a really cool blending tool. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna experiment a little bit with them today um, in addition to my trusty old blending stump. So I, I, if you happen to have those, these blending brushes and you've worked with them, I would love to hear your own experiences and anything you might have to share about them. Um, if not, a blending stump should work just fine. I should also grab a paper towel. It's also handy for blending. Now, uh, erasers. I've got my Derwent retractable eraser I've been using for quite a while. I think I need to start ordering a replacement anytime soon. So, um, And then I have my kneaded eraser as well. And then I was also uh, given from another artist this uh, this eraser here, this KUM out of Germany, this, it's like a two process erase, I mean, a sharpener here that, that I used here to get, uh, to get this long point here. So what the first, um, what the first sharpener does as you slide it through, it allows the core of the pencil to pass through while shaving away the wood. And then you use the second one to refine the point of the graphite. Now, so that it totally gives me the long points that I've been 
you know, creating for years and years using a razor blade. So it's fun to experiment with this one. So check this out. It, it uh, I don't know if you can find it locally. Hopefully you can, but it's this, you know, this KUM um, eraser here. So it's called, this one is called the Masterpiece. I don't know if there's different ones made in Germany. It's pretty awesome. So again, if anybody, I think, I can't remember who here uh, described that or, you know, asked me about it a while back. Um, and I had no idea what it was. And then uh, when this artist presented it to me, I said, oh my gosh, I heard about this before. And I was very excited. So it's fun to geek out about that stuff. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, and then uh, Jackie here, it's, this is the name of the eraser. It's this, the masterpiece made by this, this company here. I don't know if it'll focus up there. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Right. So, um, yeah, always fun to play around with new tools and experiment. Uh, I did a lot of uh, interesting things with pens and markers while I was there. That was really interesting to try out. So I shot some video. Hopefully you'll be rolling out with Artist Network soon. Um, all right. So, again, if you're following along, you're going to find the reference image in the description below. You can also find a link to the show page where you can share your work when you're done. Um, bring your friends. Bring anybody you know who might be interested in drawing and think could benefit from taking some time out to draw. Um, and if you aren't able to, Heather, it looks like you're, you'll just be kind of watching, uh, working on some other stuff. But if, if anybody um, just wants to watch along, it just go, does go up as a recording afterwards. So, um, And then the brushes, Ursula, they, they're these brushes here. They're, Dynasty is the brush name, and they're the IPCs. Um, so we have a large and the medium and a, and a small um, blending brushes that I've got. So I'll try the I'll try the small for this one and see what I don't know, see what happens or I'll interchange them. It's gonna be fun. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna do some research, see where we can find that sharpener and some of these brushes here. So it was a lot of fun. Okay, let's get to it. Um, so yeah, I've been at a trade show for many days now and very much looking forward to this experience of drawing today. Um, now, I, I really was drawn to this image because of the challenging situations with, with regards to value contrast. And especially in the image below, you can see the, the rocket off to the right side and you see that nice bright highlight. Um, I, I can anticipate hitting that with an intense, uh, an intense white. But when we look over here on the, the left side, it's going to be really tricky to distinguish the highlights on the smoke from the, the values in the sky uh, and how to create that depth. So I might play around with that. And one of the reasons I wanted to do it on this hand paper is to also play with um, the, the, the color temperature of the materials. So we have the warmth of the paper. The white charcoal here is rather cool. The graphite is rather cool as well. And when you mix the white with the graphite, that creates a lighter value that is a very distinct temperature from this warm paper. Uh, and I want to try to exploit that a little bit more today. I, I kind of was playing around in the preparatory drawing with some of those ideas and uh, I want to hopefully kind of refine them a little bit farther today. So, um, and if that doesn't make any sense, hopefully it will as we go along, I'll be circling back around to that idea. Um, so as, as I work through this, one of the, the challenges I anticipate is really getting absorbed in the, the, just the focal point of the rocket, right? You know, it's such an intense visual. Um, and then the stand next to it is so um, so complicated that I worry that I'm going to get sucked into it. So I'm, I'm intentionally starting just with these large value blocks, trying to think as abstractly about the subject as possible because I want to make sure a solid foundation is set. And if I jump into the, the detail too early, if I start refining things before I've really established this environment, then I run the risk of overwhelming the drawing and creating visual confusion for the user. 
Uh, I've also tested this paper to know that it lifts the graphite quite well. And so I'm not too concerned about covering over areas and, and not preserving enough of the, the blank paper. So, um, so if you squint your eyes, it can be really helpful in eliminating the details and allowing you to see basic value structures, value shapes. Um, and, and you may have to do some kind of mental gymnastics to try to visualize this as, as just a pure arrangement of shapes, as an abstraction. Um, I know I still struggle with it, even though I've been practicing for 20 years. It'll, I don't know as if I'll ever really be able to engage with these forms of pure abstractions as much as I'd like to. But um, there's value in the attempt, right? So... Um, all right. Oh, thank you, Rachel. I appreciate that. Um, and then Peter's asking, what paper is my favorite? That's a really tough question. Um, I, in the past, I would have say, said the, the Reeves BFK paper made by Legion. It's a cotton rag paper. It's been around for a while, and I, I love using that. The... Uh, the Somerset, though, has been a really nice one, and I'm kind of thinking that might be perhaps my favorite. You know, if I had to choose, if I, if I could only draw on one surface, what would that be? It would probably be that one. Um, although I, I really enjoy the, you know, the transition between different papers. You know, there's just something exciting about that, and pretty much every time I come to something new, I'm working on this paper, and right now I'm telling myself, I love this paper. I think this one's my favorite. And then I'll shake it up. I'll do a different one. And I'm like, I love this one. I think this one's my favorite. So um, that's, that's kind of part of the whole experience um, for me. So just wiping it down with a, with a paper towel here. See if I can start to establish the rough placement of some of the highlights using the eraser. And again, if I just squint, it creates these kind of blurred you know, regions of light and dark. Um, and this is a really light touch that I'm applying here. And you can see that I'm actually resting my fingertips. I'm trying to curl them under so it's my fingernails a little bit more so I don't have my oily fingers rubbing against the papers too much. Um, and that it helps to give a little bit more stability and control. Um, a lot of variety in the marks so that I can create kind of softer transitions. And then as we move through the drawing, it'll gradually become more and more refined. Uh, and I can be selective about where I bring refinement to the drawing. Now the, the brush, the blending brush, I don't know as if I'm going to bring that out quite yet. Um, uh, I think what I want to do is amplify the, the value a little bit more here and create a little bit more clarity and contrast around the, the flame there. Um, now, we, we've talked about this before in the show, but I, I found this particularly relevant in this drawing that the idea that, you know, the, the objects are the part of the subject that that hold our attention more tend to grow in our minds as well. And so, you know, for me, you know, when I look at this, it gets sucked right into that flame, you know, coming out of the rocket you know, engine. And as such, I have a tendency to see it larger than it actually is. Uh, so I kind of worked into my process, though, a, a kind of a mental red flag that pops up that says, well, well, Check yourself a little bit first. Check the scale of that 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 large white shape, you know, relative to the rest of the drawing. And what, the the best way that I found to do that for myself is to use that indirect gaze that we've talked about before. So what I'll do is I'll look at the reference image. I'll look over here, but put my attention on that flame, and then I'll look at the flame and I'll put my attention over here. And in doing that, it helps to see the context of the entire the entire image and it puts each of those individual elements in that proper context. Hopefully that makes sense. So um, 
And I know Heather, yeah, I think tinted charcoal, I, I did think of that as well. And I would love to see if you're able to work on that. Uh, I think that would be great to really push those those value temperatures. Now, I'm not quite as adept at those. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've struggled in working with those. I think I need a little bit more time with them. Um, but I, you know, there were those were some products that I, I saw at the trade show that um, were really exciting. That's an area where there's a lot of development happening. Um, but all right, now I think what I want to do in before I get too um, kind of too sucked into the the flame here, I'm gonna kind of try to refine the shapes a little bit. Now, this being a relatively organic form, I don't know how much measuring I want to do. Um, if that's important to any of you and you need tools to help you control those proportions, let me know. Feel free to ask any questions. Right now, I'm just kind of going by my gut, looking at the small thumbnail reference image, comparing it to the drawing, and through blurred vision, trying to see the whole thing at once, okay? Um, and then making a kind of a rough judgment about where these forms are placed, how big they are, etc. cetera. Um, now, when I squint my eyes at the reference photo, and blur, I'm actually, I'm not squinting, I'm flooding my eyes right now, but I'm letting them lose focus. So everything is blurry right now. That rocket actually pretty much disappears. I can barely see a bit of a line Right, something like that, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it like that for now. Uh, and the the challenge I want to embrace now is trying to make determinations about the overall value structure in the drawing. So, and it can get a, become a, a challenge here. You know, we look at how dark that blue sky is. There's a significant gradient as we come down. So it's so much lighter down here than it is at the top. And then we see a, a subtle value uh, relationship between that dark blue sky and then the darker parts of the clouds. But there is a distinction. And then we have the lighter cloud here that's lighter in value. I mean, it's darker in value than the, the, the flames here. Let me come over here. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. This is largely dark. When I squint my eyes, it all just falls into this large triangular dark shape. And then the, the highlights there, I think, are actually darker in value than the light here of the cloud. So just kind of think my thought process at this point, making some generalized notes so that I have some direction to, to point myself in as I'm starting to construct the forms. Now, I'm intentionally using at the side of the graphite because it helps to block in these shapes and with a subject that is so atmospheric like this you know the only real structure we see is in the the uh, the launch tower here in a little bit of the rocket maybe a little bit on the ground but there's so many you know there's the clouds there's the the billowing smoke um you know so much of this is really about soft moving forms uh, if i if I come at this with a strong line, I may um, provide too much structure and I'll have to overcome that later on. So I'm starting with a real gentle approach, soft edges, and then I'll gradually refine those edges in certain areas. And it feels like it's darker in this corner than it is over here. So I'm gonna drop some value down in here as well. Let's see. So just using this, you can see that, you know, how much graphite is picking up on the tips of my fingers. Uh, it's um, uh, it, that's in, kind of intentional because this is all about all about pressure. Letting it start by you know, just using its own weight to create the value that I'm looking for. And then uh, gradually pushing down if I need to add more. Changing up the marks, you know, so going from linear to circular, not looking for anything in, you know, particularly directional in the marks. 
and I just want to get the general shape of this cloud. That This is another area where I found it really easy to get absorbed in all of the, you know, all of that, that billowing smoke. Uh, and I, I want to keep it really organic for now. Um, Oh, Leslie. Um, no, this is on um, this is on tan toned paper. But if you're if you're if you're drawing this on white, I think it might be it might be helpful to block it in with with graphite. Um, and then if you do have a white charcoal to come in and clean up some of the brighter areas, um, that could also be helpful. Now, the advantage of this tone is I'm starting with a lower valued paper. Um, and it's going to key things a little bit differently. The quicker you get rid of the white, I think the easier it'll be for you to control the overall value key for the drawing um, and not go too light. And especially if you want to make that, um, that, that flame as, you know, as intense as you can go, you, it, you might want to push that even darker than what you're seeing in the photograph. Because one of the things that the photograph is providing is in addition to value contrast, there's color contrast. So that blue sky is contrasting that subtle yellow aura around the flame, or that orange aura, um, and just that, that contrast in the hue is going to help intensify that glow. Because we're limited in terms of that here, um, and it's largely monochromatic, uh, it, we, we may kind of compensate for that that lack of color contrast by increasing the value contrast. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so I want to kind of just rough in the dark shape. I'm gonna use the side of the I'm using the side of the block here. Not creating anything hard edged, but just trying to get a sense of the overall mass of this tower. You're know, using just the side of the, the block as it inhibits the emphasis on detail. So right now, it looks like as, as though we're looking at this subject through the, the worst eyeglasses ever invented, almost as though we're looking at it underwater. Kind of looks like a Seurat drawing, if anybody's uh, seen any of Seurat's con, uh, Conte drawings. Um, and then this, uh, Heather, this is the 4B uh, stick. Now, I... I didn't do that with any sort of intentionality. I just grabbed a graphite stick. <laughs> so, so even though it's a 4B, uh, I think it could be just about any others. All right. And this, again, smooth this out a little bit. I'll do a lot of subtracting of drawing, I think, in this. Now, let's see. Actually, I'm kind of curious what happens if I bring this over here. Yeah, it blends in nicely. And when I tested this at the trade show uh, on charcoal, what I liked about this brush is that it picked up the um, it picked up the material fairly evenly. Now I love the control and the pressure that I can use on the blending on, on the stump here because I can really use it to make marks. Um, but it also it can be uneven in how it picks up or deposits that graphite. Uh, and that can sometimes make uh, unintentional smudges on the drawing. So this could be an effective way of building up um, kind of smooth layers. Uh, it may work better in charcoal, but I can feel it moving it around a little bit. It's kind of more knocking off the, the darker areas rather than filling in the lighter. Um, but, it's, but it's interesting. Yeah, I think this could come in really handy. So I'll keep I'll keep playing around with this 
as we go through it. And I think I really want to emphasize the softness of the subject first and then be really selective about where I bring a, a level of refinement. Uh, using the palm of my hand here, it's a little less, a little less greasy. All right. Stephanie, <laughs> yes, yeah, see the Mount Vesuvius eruption of 1817, yeah. All right, so just kind of using the eraser to more take visual notes than anything right now. Uh, so I'm, what I'm doing with the, with the kneaded eraser is I'm just kind of shaping it into this point. And I really want that rocket to be vertical. Uh, so what I'm doing, I don't know if you can see it, but I have my pinky kind of locked into the channel along the edge of the paper. Um, and then I'm extending the eraser out over it, trying to maintain that distance. So I'm really using the edge of the paper as a guide so that this becomes parallel to the paper. And I do that to keep myself in check because this, while the paper looks like it's, it's squared up on my table, it may not be. And if I'm, a, if I'm making a mark that feels vertical, it, it may actually be slightly angled relative to the edges of the paper. Um, and so I, I always make sure that I, I double check some elements that I want to be vertical or horizontal against the paper itself um, and not necessarily the table I'm working on, if that makes sense. All right, so I'm just thinking about some of these main forms here. Uh, refining it a little bit more. Now, again, I'm not really measuring at this point because I, I don't think I, I don't know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow my kind of intuition to evaluate how close I am in terms of um, yeah, accuracy. Now let me, I'm going to try something here. I, I talked earlier about using color temperature um, to help create some variation here. And with the warm paper, the cool graphite and the cool uh, charcoal, if I mix the charcoal and the graphite together, it should create a nice cool yet lighter value that almost reads as blue on the sky. You know, it reminds me of an exercise that I would do with painting students. Um, and, there, and there are some um, kind of historical examples of this exercise as well, or you know, historic paintings that were created using this as um, to eliminate blue from the palette, yet create a painting that creates the impression of blue. So by using, by creating a very warm painting, so you're using lots of yellows, reds, and oranges, on your on a canvas and then you introduce like a pure gray the the principle of simultaneous contrast will you know create the impression that that gray is blue right and so what that what simultaneous contrast is is the idea that you know we never observe a color in isolation we're always comparing it to the the color that's adjacent to it the environment uh, and so you can take, you know, one color and you put it against a red background, that original color may appear more green. You know, the surrounding color gives the central color its, its complement. Uh, you take that same color and you put it against a green background, it may appear more red. Right? Um, it's a really fun thing to explore. But, um, yeah, I would assign, you know, a fun exercise where we would... Yeah, you know, create a painting where you look at it and you say, hey, that looks like blue. But it isn't, it's pure gray. It only looks that way because it's in the contrast, the context of all that orange. So fun exercise. So hopefully that will start to happen here because this is so warm as we neutralize this background here 
it emphasizes and amplifies the coolness of that color mixture or that in you know, the mixture of the charcoal and the graphite. So I'm just building it up. Now this, this charcoal is a little bit harder uh, so it can scratch a little bit more. So I'm just laying some down using my palm to spread that around and I'm looking for a certain amount of um, kind of smoothness, I guess, to the, the overall mixture. Let me see what happens if I take out this blending stump and use this. Kind of break the kind of break the um, kind of starchy stiffness of the brush. Let's see what that does. See if it does anything. I love this one when the, the palm picks up all that graphite, it becomes a drawing tool itself. Uh, I really hope this is not bad for my skin <laughs> and my health. Uh, we talked a lot about that at the conference as well. A lot of companies um, investing in new product lines that are intentionally designed for to you know address environmental and health concerns. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I'd Mad Moments Go, I think pastels would make a, a wonderful medium for this. I'm gonna darken this a little bit more with the graphite. And I just work on smoothing it. Uh, what I like about this, working this way too, is that it, I, kind, I still need to kind of warm up a little bit. My brain's not really um, kind of ready for <laughs> kind of the finer detail that's coming, and so I'm um, I'm trying to be mindful of that as well. And I think actually what I want to do is lay down a, a, a light pass of white here, not for value as much as temperature. So then you mixing that with the graphite that's on my palm is creating this, this gray, blue, cool value here. And now we have, you know, some really nice contrast. Now if I lift this up with the eraser, it should lift up both the the the, the white charcoal and the graphite. It'll mix, lift up that mixture so I get a contrast in temperature as well. Let me keep smoothing out this. And this is a, an area like a, like a cloud like this is a lot of fun just to simply play with the materials. It's a little bit more forgiving uh, than some of the kind of the structural elements. And so if you feel like just moving material around, you might hang out and work in these, uh, these cloud forms a little bit longer. Uh, that, that for me, it varies from day to day. Some days I'll, you know, just embrace the challenge of kind of rigid structure. And some days I'll thoroughly reject it. So. Now I need to I need to keep looking up at the screen. The screen is displaying what's being captured by the camera overhead, um, and there's a bit of a bit of a shine off the paper from my perspective here that's influencing how I interpret those values. So you may consider that as well. Um, you know, keep tipping your drawing up, changing up the context a little bit if, as much as you can to double check your. Uh, you know, your value structure, your proportions, and everything. So, all right, and I might, again, kind of come back in with a little bit more of that white, again, mostly to, mostly to cool it down than anything. 
Now, in this, in this photograph, everything seems to be in focus for the most part. So this is a, uh, an opportunity for us to kind of editorialize a little bit. Um, and I think I want to push the depth of field a little bit more by making these clouds more abstract and just unfocused, unrefined. So just kind of playing around with marks and see what what feels good. Like I just there's this now vertical stripe here that doesn't exist in the reference image, but I like it. Um, it's subtle, but I like that it it uh, it kind of reflects the vertical nature of that um, of the rocket there. So. We talk about that a lot, you know, I think we all have our own kind of thermostat, as it were, with regards to accuracy and precision. And we're going to be, all, each of us is going to be set differently. Um, and sometimes we change that ourselves, some, you know, some, so you may be looking at this and say that that sky looks nothing like the photograph. And tomorrow I may look at this and I'm, if I were to draw this, I may take a totally different approach and maybe I would want it to be more accurate, but for today, I'm feeling confident that it's it's all right to be, you know, you know, to editorialize a little bit to adjust it based on how I'm feeling today. Um, all right, let's see. Peter Frost, can I draw a moon on black paper? That could be an interesting subject. I haven't done the moon yet. Um, I will certainly put that in the catalog of ideas. I am right here, I'm gonna just play around with that value structure. So, you know, what, what we're thinking about is just the basic, um, sequence of lighter to darker to lighter to darker to light to dark etc um, and in the cloud you can have some variation so here there's part of the cloud that's a little bit darker than the blue sky there's a part up here that's a little bit lighter um, and that helps to all kind of unify the the drawing On pushing the stuff around with this brush. It's an interesting blending tool. I would love to try this with graphite powder, I think. So now if you want to refine the cloud even farther, what you can do is you can start by selecting one particular area. So here I see a part of the cloud that is darker, it's all shaded. So using the side of the pencil, I'm just using these small circular marks to try to discover that edge, right? Um, I'm looking back and forth between the reference image and the drawing. And rather than drawing an outline and then filling it in, I'm trying to build the form more from the center out. And in that way, it helps me to, to create more dimension in the, in the cloud. So let's see. Hello, Mariana. Um, yeah, I do think charcoal would work very similarly. Um, and I did consider working with charcoal. Um, and I wish I had a better reason why I didn't. I just, it would, I just felt like working on graphite today. <laughs> so I think charcoal would work really well. Um, yeah, the, the, the one thing about charcoal is there is perhaps more variability in the color temperature. So often compressed charcoal sticks can be um, warmer in, in temperature than say vine charcoal or willow charcoal. And then just between brands, you, can, might, you might find some variation as well. So just if you are using color temperature and a blending of the white and black, um, just something that you might look at.
All right, how we're doing on time? So these these drawings generally take about two hours. This one may go a little bit faster. Um, I don't know. We'll see. But I like taking time a little bit long more than um, I think I did with the preparatory sketch. Now what I'm looking at here is, you know, I see this cool going from lighter to darker, and then we shift in value and temperature. It gets a little bit lighter and warmer. And I think what I want to do is cool this whole area down by just lightly laying down some of this, this white charcoal. It's really muddying the, the charcoal um, pencil, but that's all right. We can just clean it off. I'm, I'm spending more time on this color temperature than I anticipated. And I'm willing to kind of sacrifice any sort of structure that I may have established with that, um, that, that tower to focus on that background, really laying in a, a solid foundation. Because I can always erase out and build on top of the um, that background layer. All right, so just trying to smooth things out a little bit. And again, this is where the reflecting light off of the surface is really kind of messing with my head a little bit. When I look at the paper from here, it looks like a perfect gradient. I look up on the screen and there's a noticeable difference as we shift through here. Um, and I'm trusting what's on the screen more than what's what I'm seeing with my bare you know, eyes here. Um, and so in order to create a smoother gradation, what I'm doing is also targeting the lighter areas in the spot. So rather than lightening the dark spots, I'm darkening the light spots and then kind of smoothing out. And I'm hoping that that's going to be a little bit better. And, and then there's an area like this, there's this noticeable little dot here. I can refine my kneaded eraser and just kind of tap on it. And it lifts it up. And I can blend it out, and it should start to um, it should start to address those kind of blotchy areas. So again, it depends on how persnickety you want to be with all of that. All right, let's see. I say all right a lot. I need to stop doing that. Let's see, but how's everybody doing? Everybody feeling good? Anybody working on this with a completely different approach? Um, I think there's there's some complexity in the cloud in the background here in the photograph that I'm going to ignore and that I hope that will what that will do is isolate that really glowing cloud uh, and draw more attention there. All right, let's see. This is the B. Yeah, this is the B. It's a little bit harder than the others. I'm going to start with that to see if that if this is even going to show much. It's not really going to show anything because this is actually harder than that graphite I laid down. So it's not doing much to leave marks. But it may be helpful in refining some of these. So say along here, if I wanted to sharpen up this edge, um, just like I over here, I was working on the cloud, adding that dark area of the cloud and working out to the edge. I can focus on this part of the sky being a little bit darker, working up to the edge of the cloud. So working in that negative space to refine that. Like right here, I just have this generic stripe. If I want to make that more specific, I can work in that negative space, kind of smoothing out that background, working my way up to that edge to give it a bit more specificity. So, And then working back out to smooth it out. So in this way, I'm just trying to be selective about where I'm refining edges 
And I don't, I don't know if there's really any strategy that I'm employing other than just saying, oh, this, this seems like an area that would be interesting to sharpen up a little bit more. So it just got, gave a lot a little bit more structure. Um, now, already we can start to see a bit of the final effect that we want down in here where we have cool to warm, but very similar values so that the light in those clouds is similar in value to the light of the sky, but they're distinguished, that we can see them um, you know, nicely de defined against one another. So I, I think what I want to do now is actually move over here to um, this, this rocket form. So let's get to that. Uh, let me start by kind of refining this this platform. And I think I will need to move from the B to the, a different one. And if you don't have the exact same pencils, I don't really pay too much attention to the specific uh, pencil that I'm using, but I am thinking about whether it's generally harder or generally softer. So I know the, the five B is softer than the one that I just had. So I'm just going to jump to that. But if this was a 3B or a 4B or a 6B, I think I would have been just as happy because I do a lot of controlling of those values through pressure control. Um, now, having said that, one of the things I learned from um, a pencil manufacturer over the weekend was, you know, how much work they uh, they put into really controlling those values in a range of pencils so that you don't have to spend too much time emphasizing pressure, that you can just, you can apply the same pressure to any pencil, um, but you'll create the variations in value based on the relative hardness of that pencil. Um, it's really fascinating to hear what goes into all of that. A lot of, a lot of stuff with, um, with water soluble products as well. Water soluble graphite and water soluble pencils, colored pencils, I mean watercolor pencils, um, all things that I want to experiment with. All right. So, as with the cloud, I want to be kind of mindful about how I'm creating structure in this. Uh, in the structure and where I'm bringing a, a degree of refinement. And so to help guide me, you squinting, blurring vision again is really helpful, especially with these complex forms. Uh, now what happens when we bring our eyes into focus on something is that we deprioritize value relationships. And so we'll create uh, what our, our brains will do when we encounter something like this. If I'm really focused in on that part of the reference image, it'll actually pump up the contrast to increase the clarity of all of the, the refined details. Um, so it'd be kind of like in, it's like our brain has a mental, you know, like its own version of Photoshop that is working with and I say we're zooming in on a certain area and we want to see it with more clarity and then we, we go in and pump up that contrast and it really blows it out, um, making it kind of artificial, um, but it, it helps you to see that area in, with greater clarity. And so that's why, you know, focus prioritizes uh, you know, one set of information over another and it may not always serve your best interest. So I think what I want to do in this is I'm, I'm just kind of reacting to the main forms. I want to be thinking a bit about, um, about the, the perspective and the structure. And so if we have the rocket being vertical here, there is a slight angle. We're, we're below all of this. We're looking up at the top of that platform. So our eye level is down here somewhere. So that means that if on this side of the tower, if we were to extend these diagonal lines these orthogonals, these edges far enough, they would all appear to meet at a single point on that horizon line. Um, now, and that's this side here is a different plane than this side. 
this side here, if we were to extend those angles far enough, they would appear to meet at, a, at a, their own point on the horizon line off to the right here. Now, this whole area is all, all sorts of wonky because they're not, it's not perpendicular to one another. This is where perspective gets really tricky is when you start to have objects that are no longer perpendicular to one another. Perspective works great in a very rigid system where everything is parallel or perpendicular to one another and you're dealing with lots of right angles. Um, so, and, and even then I, I prefer to start by making marks with, by simply eyeballing it, using kind of more of my intuition than anything. But if I can hold in my mind really just the, the basic idea that the angles at the top of the tower are going to be kind of steeper, they're going to be angling down towards a vanishing point, and as we move closer to the horizon line, they're going to be leveling out, and that's going to happen on the, on the left side as well as the right side, it can help me um, just kind of eyeball things. And again, I'm going to actually, I need to be looking at the the TV when I do this, or the, not the TV, the monitor, because, because I'm working at an angle here, I'm compensating for that perspective of the, of the receded plane. Um, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven-ish, plus the top, so one, two, three, four, There's about eight platforms, so I'm just kind of guessing um, where those go. Uh, and then I want to I want to correct this angle here. So so much of the perspective of this tower is going to be defined by the relationship between these two angles here. I'm getting those right will be tremendously helpful. Now, this side here feels pretty good. Um, I feel like I generally have the right angles. Now, watch what happens though. You know, if I feel like this starts to have correct perspective, say I, I don't pay attention to the direction of my marks over here, if I just make these straight, it creates this twist in the, in the, the building, in the structure because it's, it's conflicting with our understanding of, of the perspective. We have enough of the structure pers of, and perspective defined that if anything falls out of that, um, our understanding of the angle it should be going at, then it becomes really noticeable. And so as we work our way down here, this gets really obscured. This whole area is really complex. I'm not going to go in there and get every little one, um, but we can kind of suggest it. And there's light hitting this side of this tower, and that seems to be turned a little bit. It's got its own own structure, its own perspective. And then I'll try to just block these in. And if I can get the main forms established, then what I can do is slowly start adding more of these complex elements until I find a nice balance, until I found enough that triggers something in the viewer's mind to fill in that missing information. Uh, let's see. And I'm not using a ruler. Um, and I'm doing that on purpose because my, my worry is that that kind of artificial, um, really strict, rigid line will end up pulling more attention than I want. 
because everything else in this drawing is kind of loose and organic. But when it comes to the rocket, I may actually pull out a straight edge there so that I really have that hard edge and it helps to make that the focal point. Um, uh, Let's see, Samana is saying, have you ever drawn something as another thing? I saw a guy drawing a fish as a helmet the other day, and it worked even though he was new to drawing. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then uh, Shripad, uh, to sharpen that, the pencil, I often use a razor blade to do it, but I just introduced this, I was just introduced to this pencil sharpener. This is this, it's called a, I'll hold it up here, it's this K-U-M. And it's this masterpiece pencil. So again, if you're new, I'll show it off because it's really cool too. So let's take a look. It's got two phases in a sharpening pass. So when you, when you slide it through number one, you can see that it passes the core of the pencil straight through. So as you are sharpening, it's just going to sh shave off. It's taking off some of the, um, the core, but it takes off the wood. And then you move it into the, into the second one to just refine the, the point. So in that way, it exposes more of the core, uh, which, is, which is how I like to work. Because then I can lay the pencil down flat and create nice broad marks, and I can control the pressure more effectively. All right. All right, let me move quickly here, because we're about an hour in. And now I chose to work on that tower first, because that will allow me to uh, kind of engage with the, the smoke plume uh, with, uh, through the negative space. So I'm thinking now as I'm drawing that tower, I'm trying to visualize the edge of where that smoke, that billowing cloud is, and working up to that edge. So it helps me to refine that form. And as we come down here, um, we can we could still be thinking about that. So I'm trying to imagine that that cloud shape is there already. And as I work on the uh, the structure here, uh, that I I'm thinking about you know, just stopping those marks right up to where the edge of that cloud is. And then, and then it gets, the value relationship shifts. So now we have this being, again, light against the darker clouds. So what I can do is darken the clouds here. Just using that side of the pencil. This is why it's helpful to have the, the wood shaved away like that, because I can really lay that down flat and blend a little bit. Let me try the, the paper blender here. Now the trick to working with these clouds that I found, the thing that, the, that was really the hardest for me was to really observe the, the irregularity of those forms. It's so easy to just create loops and swirls that create a repeated and regular pattern. And that is ultimately an unnatural thing. I can darken this part under the cloud. I start to provide a little bit more structure there, but I want to, my main focus now is building up that contrast between light and dark, and then this becomes dark against that shadow form of the cloud. So kind of working both the structure and the cloud form. All right, so then what I think I need to do, though, is increase that contrast even further. I don't really have the structure quite placed, so there's, there's an inconsistency here but that's all right. I'm not too worried about it. I think it reads effectively as what I'm as, as a tower here against the cloud, even though the cloud doesn't quite match the uh, the reference photo. All 
and then under this tower, there's a little bit of darkness under here. You can see the underside of this platform. And so what I found with a structure that's complex like this is to kind of try to build it all up at once as much as possible, just because it's so easy to get lost. <laughs> You know, if I map it out and then work from top to bottom, adding all of those juicy details, I tend to get lost. And that, I think, is, is largely just a functioning of my brain, the way it naturally processes information. So I, would, I need to give it more practice in order to be able to, to, be able to manage that. Um, it's like my, one of my heroes in painting is Neil Welliver, who worked in a curious way from, you know, within his studio paintings, he would work from the top left to the lower right, kind of finishing as he goes, and he would never go back. You know, so if his color was slightly off in the, in the, the, the parts that he had already completed, he would adjust them by controlling the new colors around it rather than going back and fixing it. It was really a, an, I think it's a, it's a, an amazing way to work, and he, but yet he openly said, you know, it's curious. I'm not sure I'd recommend it to anybody else. <laughs> Just what worked for him. So I hope that's something that you all do as well is kind of embrace kind of what's natural to the way you work and process information, challenge it sometimes, but just know that we all handle things a little bit differently. Um, now this side here is relatively dark and there's some kind of details in there that I, I think I just want to let the viewers mind suggest. And then you know, there's a lot of kind of diagonal marks. I'm not really not really calculating or placing these much. I'm just kind of re reacting almost gesturally to this. Now with my sharpened eraser, I could also come back in and add some light lines to add some, um, some of these lighter areas. And that helps to refine the, the edges too. Actually, I'm gonna take off more of that and then come back in So don't be afraid to kind of work, you know, alternating, you know, lay down graphite, lift it with the eraser, cut into it, um, lay more down, cut into it again with an eraser until you find the, the balance that you're looking for. And again, I'm mostly trying to suggest forms rather than to be explicit. Uh, and part of that, what happens is that if, if, if you kind of suggest with a certain degree of confidence, the viewer's mind will accept those forms and fill in the missing information. And it does that because that's just the natural state of our brains. We're constantly inventing stuff in our minds. It's kind of like the, the, resting, <laughs> the, you know, the resting mode of our brains is to invent things. Um, you know, everything that we see is being is first interpreted and anticipated by the mind. So we, we in essence, hallucinate the world around us, and then we reconcile it with the optical information, and we get, we it pulls our attention to the areas that seem a little bit out of place from what we expected it to be. Um, we're constantly filling in information just because the raw data of optical information is too much for our brains to handle. It's not very efficient. Um, so to make it more efficient, it starts to invent stuff. And I want to rely on that for the viewer, let them fill in some of that missing information. Um, now this does seem to kind of float a little bit, and I do like that there are uh, some elements that interject into this space here. And you can see when I'm making those marks, trying to anticipate those marks and then striking it 
rather than going slow and steady. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that I, I hear from a lot of people who, you know, I, you know, when I say I'm, I draw or have a book out on drawing, and they say, "Oh, I can't even draw a straight line." Drawing a straight line is really hard. <laughs> you know, it. There's no shame in using a ruler. I can't draw a straight line, and why would we? We've got tools that can do that. Um, but I find it if I'm am freehanding a line, you know, kind of visualizing, anticipating the stroke, and then striking with one go is often um, uh, just a more comfortable mark than um, than really trying to go slow with it. So now we have the top of the tower here, and I'm going to estimate. I'll place it here. I'm going to visualize it. You see, I'm practicing that that edge. I'm trying to visualize it. I'm gathering up my courage to start laying down marks, and I'm not going to. Um, I think I need to find it a little bit more. So I'm not going to strike it with that, with that one in that one go like I just did before. And then I can use this. Nice sharpened eraser. And that can give us a suggestion of the light on the side of that antenna thing. There's a, uh, there's a facility near the house here where they actually make engines for rockets and you got to go tour that. It's pretty awesome. All right, now uh, this is the B. Now, this, since this is relatively light, I'm going to move into the, the negative space of the sky, try to find the edge of that cloud. Now, I'm going to start working the um, that flame a bit here. And I'm not going to get it right the first go, so I'm going to really try to move some material around to try to find it. There is a kind of a central core to that flame, and then there's this glow around it, and then there are these areas that really kind of wick away from that. And then right down here is the base of the rocket. And one of the things I can feel myself doing is calibrating to the values on the page. So now I need to remind myself that I'm going to be going quite a bit lighter in value down here. But you're already starting to feel the glow of the rocket here. And part of that is that anticipation of our mind. We're looking at all the visual information and it's, it's providing more confirmation to our brains that this is and some sort of rocket launch, and these are flames, and there's clouds, and starting to fill that information in. I want to find the top of the rocket. And I'm going to create this form largely from the inside out. So rather than create an outline for the rocket, I'm going to try to find its central axis, and then work out from on the left and right sides. Start by moving out to the right, kind of feathering it off to the left a little bit. And then do I need a straight edge? I'm gonna kind of straighten this up here. Okay. So I just grabbed a pencil as a straight edge. I'm trying to be really careful so that I don't create a strong line. Well, it's too light, however. I can see it when I'm up close. Let me make sure I'm not in the shot. So take your time in this area. Don't rush it. And uh, like there's this dark spot here that's competing with it. So I'm just finding the edge of the rocket and then kind of dragging away. Now I've created a light spot. Let's see what happens if I rub it out there. Okay. 
that feels all right for now. But I think, yeah, I really need to I need to address this. Whatever this, there's something on the paper that's really holding that. And it's probably from my oily fingers. It's not being careful earlier. But, all right. So this is taking just a little bit more focus, so thinking less. But I do want to, that glow on the right side is bothering me a little bit, so I'm just trying to fill that in a, a touch. So right on this side, the light is striking it. If I, I can be a little bit heavier on the right where that falls into shadow, I need to keep that strategy of working from the center outward and the center upward to find that point. And then I can use the eraser to kind of discover this side of it. And there's light catching the whatever condensation seems to be happening here. So it's, again, I'm just using the, the light of the paper for now, but we're going to come back in with the, uh, the white pencil soon, and it's going to really create the contrast we need. So now I'm going to come back in. I'm going to use the eraser to kind of extract some of the shape for that, for this plume. And especially with regards to the, uh, these, these flames that kind of wick out from the bottom. Now it's not quite as vertical as I really want it to be. So let me see. I'm just going to really lightly fill in some of that negative space. And as I go, making sure I'm feathering out as I go so that I don't create too much of a distinct halo around that, um, that flame. So this is what I said earlier about massaging that, that a bit, working left and right, um, working additively and subtractively. This part comes down a little bit more here. And then I can erase this out a little bit more. So where I add the white, I, I want to lift off as much of the, the graphite as possible. So I'll lift that off here. You can use kind of the corner of a, a rubber eraser to get a little bit more control if you need it. So now I can draw a little bit with the eraser, um, thinking through the, the structure of these clouds. And one of the things I do is I'm paying attention to how this rolls left and right. So as I need to, I can lean into it this way to find a harder edge, kind of lay it down a little bit to soften that edge. There's a, a touch to it that, um, you know, that I, I try to employ. Um, and you can see that a lot of this, I'm just kind of tapping more than really dragging. So I don't want to create light, light colored lines. I, I want them to be, you know, lighter spots, if that makes sense. Now working in a, a little bit into some of that negative space. So being able to think both additively and subtractively, thinking in terms of positive space and negative space, can be really helpful in this. And that's true, I think, when drawing any cloud. We, we tend to get focused on the form itself, but if you can switch your focus to thinking of the shape of the, the, the sky behind it, you know, or whatever's behind that lighter form, it can be very helpful.
And here there's a nice hard edge. And I we, we've, we've talked about this as well before. I have a tendency to kind of fall into a rhythm of my marks that I have to fight. So what, right now there's, like, I want to just start making loops around the, the, the cloud and that that's an instinct that I have to override. And I think I want to kind of lighten this in general. So I'm just using this as a, a actually I'm going to use the, um, the kneaded eraser. I, I want to lift more of this. Maybe leave that as dark as it is, but lift more from the center. And then when I add the white, hopefully that's going to create the, the cloud. So I'm going to do that right now. So I'm going to start by using a, 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 a light pressure with this white charcoal. Um, Oh, Rhonda Adams, have you, has anyone here used the Tombow Mono Zero Eraser? Yes, we've talked about that. I, I need to find my Tombow Eraser. That I kind of forgot all about that. I used that for quite a bit. So thanks for bringing that up. That's a wonderful eraser for, um, for fine details. Uh, Greg, I think that's one that you had, had mentioned that you use. So here when we're, we're addressing this point of contact. Um, you can see that the glow kind of rides up onto that rocket form and then gradually fades out, right? So um, before I start lightening anything up here, I'm gonna first finish this, you know, this, this really forceful, you know, kind of the, the thrusting of an explosion of the engine. So now, that's a pretty hard edge, and I, I see in the in the reference photo more of a glow. And now with the warmer paper, as I lift off some of that um, that graphite, I still have that edge defined, but I'm allowing the warmth of the paper to suggest the that glow. And I think I might do that a little bit more. All right, so then if we wanted to work our way out and get some of those flames that kind of wick out. Now, I, again, I'm using the side of the pencil more than anything for this, and it allows me to kind of roll it and create irregular marks and let it do its thing sometimes rather than really try to see that specific shape, I'm trying to capture the, the flow and the energy more and let the pencil flow where I feel like it needs to go. I love this little wisp up there. I might amplify that a little bit. And we come down here. And you know, it really catches um, it really catches that that intense value. Um, so I'm gonna get that shape working again from the center out. This is more of what I'm gonna call inside out drawing. Um, working from the center of the form and then moving outward to find its edges rather than from the outside in. Um, and then, but I'm going to be a little bit lighter in my touch because then what happens is you can see that there's this, there's this other kind of cloud form that comes in on top that that edge catches it and stands out. Um, so again, j and focus on the irregular. Um, kind of rhythm of that cloud form, because if you if you create kind of a consistent looping thing, it's going to feel unnatural. And again, I, I say that because that's something that I, I kind of need to remind myself of. And by saying it out loud, I hold myself accountable to you all, because <laughs> that's something that I just I fall into all the time. So right here, it's a little bit lighter pressure because this is actually darker. And it's one of the things that I thought could be really helpful by choosing this subject because it allows us to think both additively and subtractively, both positive space and negative space. So 
Um, and that can be really helpful to do. Uh, again, if you don't have these same materials, that's totally fine. I think you can still create a very strong drawing um, and you'll learn a different set of things by doing that. But um, here the light is stronger. I'll kind of work my way out. So this is a really good example. I'll be working on that light in the cloud, but I need to be mindful of this shape of this cloud here as well as the shape here. So there's, you know, we're, uh, while I'm working on this one shape, it's also defining something else. It, it's doing more than one thing. Uh, I find that if I, because this is now a regular, it's got flat spots in it and it's got, it's starting to get a little jagged. If I just kind of scrape and roll, it starts to create these kind of irregular forms. And there's, again, I need to be visualize this cloud in front of there. So I'm just, and I'm lightening the, the pressure a little bit, to try to find those edges, kind of working again from the inside out. Uh, and I don't want to get too stuck in one spot. And then kind of leaning in a little bit along in here, just trying to observe where the lightest lights are. And I come down in here. Again, I'm just kind of rolling that pencil, trying to feel the flow of those clouds more than anything, rather than trying to match it one to one trying to capture the overall direction. Again, that's one of the things we talked about before. When it comes down to it, if you can focus on direction of your shapes and the, of your marks and the shape that, that you're going for, those two things together, shape and direction, what shape is it, what direction do I make the marks, that can get you a long way to, to really rendering something effectively. So if you find that there's just too many things to think about, kind of step back a little bit and think, try to just say, what shape am I drawing and what direction do I need to make those marks? And then start to layer on information from there. You can say, is it too light? Is it too dark? Is it too big or is it too small? Is it in the wrong spot? Does it need to move up or down? Um, but there can be so many things to pay attention to that it can be overwhelming sometimes. And that's why practice makes so much difference because through practice, you automate certain things and you don't have to have all of the, the things required for an effective drawing to be top of mind at all times. But that's also why it's, it's really helpful to teach because it helps, for me, it helps me become aware of uh, why I do some things that maybe I have automated and to kind of round this edge here, I'm just kind of lifting and dragging so that this cloud doesn't feel too flat, giving it a little bit more structure there. So, um, uh, oh, and so Frederick, yeah, this, right now I'm using a General's charcoal white pencil, and I've been mostly using then graphite, uh, like a, a 5B is for the most part, and then a little bit softer if you need to. Um, all right, thank you, everybody. And then Greg saying, you always tone your paper and draw negatively to create clouds. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, check out Greg's work. Uh, I think it's a really good example of working with those clouds, especially with a, kind of an architectural element integrated. Greg, if you want, I don't know if you want to share your website or not, but I think that could be helpful. Um, with a light touch here, I'm going to just bring in a little bit of light in a few key areas to suggest more of this structure. And then maybe like, like right along in here. I don't want it to be too strong. Kind 
kind of making these marks that suggest negative space in there. Um, now, I, I do feel like I need to give a little bit more information here on this, whatever's coming off the side of this rocket, but I want to make sure it's not competing with that highlight. There's a, a little glint hitting there. Um, all right. So I'm happy with the glow there. You can see that it's a little bit darker in value, but it's largely just the tone of the paper, um, and it's creating that contrast through the, um, you know, just the, the, uh, the white in comparison. Now, a blending sump, this is well used and loaded up. That can be helpful in some areas as well. So what I'll do is I'll kind of start in those, that dark area underneath this cloud and just kind of pull up and around that form to make it get, have a little bit more dimension. And what I like about drawing with a blending stump is that it just, it's a little bit gentler than, the, uh, than working with a pencil. So if you have a new blending stump, what you might try doing is on a scrap piece of paper, just building up some graphite and then just rubbing it with the blending stump, rolling it as you go so that you get an even distribution of graphite on your stump. And then you can start to, you can start to draw with it. Um, and I'm just thinking about, you know, now some of the darker areas in these, these billowing areas. And that's like, if I can drop just a little bit of information, it could be enough to bring more life to this. And again, opening it up for the viewer to fill in missing information. Like right in here, I can add a little bit more variety. And I try to just make one or two marks, look, move on, you know, make another couple marks and then move on. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that for now. Let's see. Um, uh, I'm sorry to hear about that, Leslie. It, yeah, it's hard. I, I, I again, I use the side of the pencil a lot, and sometimes I'll actually support it with my my finger here as I'm going along, just to provide a little bit more support so it doesn't break. Um, but it definitely happens, and and it's a frustration sometimes. So <laughs> I hear you. Um, Let's see. Um, now I can. I want to see what happens if I lift a little bit more of the paper around it to really show off that glow around the flame. Actually, where's that brush? Yes, use the brush. Let's see what this does. Bring some of that around. That reduced some of the intensity, but it softened it nicely. So actually I'm knocking down some of those high areas just to soften it, build up some of that glow. And then if I come back in again, it should reestablish that central part of the flame, give it a little bit more structure there. So don't be afraid to really play with this area here. I know it can feel like a lot of pressure sometimes to, to try to get it really dialed in um, and try to and just leave it, don't mess it up. But I, I think that even if the draw, see, say it does completely collapse into an irredeemable and you know mess on the surface, keep going with it because that's where you're going to really learn about the materials, right? So. Um, I've definitely had that experience many times, and it can be frustrating. 
Um, but if you feel like the drawing is just falling apart, don't let it just be a total waste of time. Keep going with it so that if anything, you walk away with just a deeper understanding of, of how those materials can work and, and what you might do differently with a second attempt. That's why we draw together. You never, and we, and we do this every week because it's, it's part of the practice. It's part of the grind of being a, an artist is you just keep going and you always have another, another image, another painting, another drawing that you're going to be working on. All right. Okay, so I'll let that be. I might actually build up a little bit of value here to show a little bit more contrast. Now what do I want to do? Okay, I think I want to, I'm going to work on the ground and then build in that clouds. And I think part of that is really just because I'm intimidated by those clouds and I want to wait till they're in. I, I don't want to deal with them now. So I'm procrastinating. So um, you may decide to work on that area, but that's, um, and that's totally fine. Um, I don't think I have a very good reason for making the choice I have, but it's the reason I have nonetheless. So I'm going to try to identify this area here. I don't want to create a strong line, but when I squint my eyes, this is all dark. This is, this is another area where I feel like squinting, um, the, the power of squinting reveals itself. Because if I, when I look um, with focus at this area, I see the light hitting that concrete pad. And the tendency is to then increase the intensity of that light in my mind. I see it as brighter than it actually is. And when I squint, it puts everything in check. So then I see that it's actually relatively dark and I can lighten some areas, but as a whole, this is dark. Um, and what's going to make it feel like those light hitting it is going darker in some other areas. So I'm not going as dark as I can go, um, but I am going relatively dark. Here, okay. So I'm looking for some forms here. There's this rectangular form. And what I'm doing here is I'm visualizing that rectangle and just creating a sequence of these diagonal marks rather than drawing that in completely. I'm just trying to visualize that form and building up that shape. And this is all pretty dark here. So then by establishing these dark forms, now I have some contrast of the va that initial value that I just laid down. Um, I, can, I can see how much lighter I might need to go. And here it gets relatively dark too. Okay. And then there's this tower. That's really cool. Drop that tower in. So I'm trying to think fairly abstractly about this, this step here. So very similarly to how I, I started the drawing, just think about areas of light and dark, you know, just various shapes, not trying to define them or label them, I'm just reacting to those forms. And I'm starting by looking at those for the darker areas, seeing what contrast is created, and then from there I can figure out how much lighter I might need to go with certain things. So there, this area lightens up, and then I come down here to the ground plane. This is relatively level. So I'm going to establish this. This is dark. Ooh, that broke it. Actually, I'll use the use this graphite tip, so don't waste that. Or I can use this. This is better. This graphite block. Really darken that. Now you can see how that value is totally changed because we've changed the relationship between it and the, the values around it. All right, blending brush, do your thing. 
I like this blending brush. Okay, and now there's this. The grass here. Now I need to ask myself, how much information do I really need here? So I'm going to keep adding it until I found a balance that I'm comfortable with. Let me smooth this out. Um, so I think what I want to do to kind of guide my decisions in this area is to think about that depth, creating that, that sense of depth here. Now, one of the things that is really helpful is that I can see this line here. So I just, I think if you can just do some angle sighting, so close one eye, flattening your depth perception, take a pencil or stick like this, hover over your, your reference image until it aligns with the targeted edge. So I'm trying to find this angle here against the reference image. I'm gonna lock my wrist and compare it to the drawing that I have. And then I can make some adjustments from there. Um, now, so right now the depth is, is, it's pretty flat. There's not a lot of depth. This helps having that angle. If I can drop in this other one here, that helps. And then this, I have this, this concrete edge here. That helps as well. Now, I'm not using value at this point to help me create depth. So what I can do, I'll start with the kneaded eraser. I can see down here where there's some of that, that glowing mist catching along there. And right in here. And I'm just letting the, the kneaded eraser do the work for me. I'm just kind of shaping it into a rough point and just tapping it along the page so it creates this irregular thing. I'm not thinking about matching that exact um, kind of billow uh, on the page. I'm just letting it, letting it do its thing. Okay, now... I can take this out here and I can start to, if this is too dark, I can start to lighten it. I'm just gonna start with a really light pressure, let it smudge, and then keep laying, applying pressure until it starts to lift the way I want it to. And then the same with here. So with the light kind of coming from here in the center, it's catching on that concrete um, surface more at the back. And then I think that's what's gonna create the depth. It's, it's about creating a distinction from foreground to background, that there's a change as you go along. Give it a little bit more structure there. Lighten up along there a little bit more. And then I'm just gonna create a little bit more contrast here I think actually what I'll do is use the broad side of this to work my way up the slope. See if that'll reinforce that, that direction of the plane by adding some subtle directional marks there. I don't like that mark there. So 
So just keep working it, laying some stuff down. Keep trying things too. You know, I just kind of move into a drawing with the assumption that I can correct most mistakes. Um, so that it gives me some some room to experiment. Uh, you know, there's there's some things I and I, I really enjoy that part of the drawing process where I don't really know what I'm doing next. Um, there we go. Grab this darker. If I can maintain a certain sense of discovery in the process, it makes me very happy. So sometimes I, I try to try to engage that part of my brain that remembers what it was like to you know, just still be discovering drawing. And um, you know, let that come into the whole drawing experience. All right, now this shape down here is relatively flat. So now we're creating some depth back there. Now we hit this wall where there's no real change from foreground to back. Now I've broken two of my dark ones. So I need to be a little bit more careful. And so I'm going to be thinking about varying it from bottom to top as well as from left to right. And there's, uh, I can't remember which company is making a, um, a graphite that um, is a matte finish. It's not quite as shiny, which is pretty awesome. All right, <laughs> I've, broken, I've broken the tips of all three of my pencils. That's why I have a fourth ready to go, though. So can't stop me. Um, okay, we're almost done. I think we should be able to finish it up in about 15 minutes. I do want to take a break, see if I have any questions that I'm not addressing. If I did miss a question above, um, please uh, feel free to ask again. I may have just missed it. Um, uh, let's see. All right, doesn't look like I have any other questions. So, But if there are, just let me know. I'm going to work on this. What I need, I think, I'll just use this to point myself in the right direction. This down here is really kind of ambiguous. Um, so I'm looking in reference to this light cloud here and the structure off to the right. Uh, I'm looking here on the, the side of the pencil. Um, Oh, uh, the, the Faber-Castell matte is what Jackie's saying. Interesting. I can't decide if I like them or not, but pen and ink uh, loves them. All right, your hubby, hubby loves them. That's awesome. Um, it, yeah, I did find, Greg, that I, that sharpener didn't work so well for me with the charcoal white. Um, but I... Um, it was my first time sharpening with it, and I don't know if there's some sort of technique that I could be employing that could help. Um, so I, what I'm find, looking for right now are kind of basic, basic shapes. I'm going to kind of point myself in the right direction by, by describing a light line. I'm dragging on the side of the pencil intentionally um, so that I don't emboss a line here. What I want to do, I think, is, again, kind of work from the inside out, just kind of blocking in that form. As I move up to the edge, I can kind of lean in on the tip, roll it a little bit to add a little bit more specificity. But I think as we move to the left edge, I don't need it to be all that precise or refined of an edge. I can just let it... I just need to make sure that it feels finished enough that the viewer can look at it and accept it as cloud, and then they'll fill in the rest. Um, so again, I'm just kind of working from the inside out, letting the pencil roll in my fingers as I'm using the side of the pencil to create a more defined shape. I can come down here, and then there's this 
this really cool plume that reaches out and kind of points to that rocket. It's like a finger in the cloud just saying, hey, look at that. And this one is relatively dark as well. And what I want to do is just kind of map out the areas dark first. As I get to this complex area, rather than try to solve that problem now, I'm just going to keep moving on to the bigger forms. Come down here, this catches light. It's really kind of soft and they're bigger forms. I'm going to come back up in this direction. And so I'm just thinking uh, kind of in terms of negative space, building up those, the darker shapes that I'm observing. Yeah, I was talking with a... Um, a you know, person at um, Karen Dash about a graphite set there, and he was describing the the levels to which they pay attention to the granulation of the graphite in pencils. So intentionally mixing larger and smaller pieces so that they lock together better, and that allows them to use less of the clay binder. Um, and it. It was really fascinating to, to hear that. I'm excited to learn more because I know the generals of the pencil building process. Um, but it, it's always so amazing to talk with people who are invested in the industry because, you know, there, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. And the end result is hoping that we all make stuff that we're happy with and it brings joy to our lives. And it's, I think that's really awesome. You know, of course, they're finding new ways to distinguish themselves against competitors, but the way to do that is to make things that really work for artists and not just say, oh, they just got to use what we make and that's it. All right. So... I think at this point I need to, actually I'm going to soften this a little bit, especially this one here. It's going to move the brush in a, in a way that in some way reflects the, the energy that I'm feeling of, of the clouds, you know, the way it's rolling, the way it's moving. Let's see if that's helpful at all. And then I will use this eraser to start to bring a little bit more ref refinement. So the, the dark areas are less refined. I'm going to bring more precision to the, the light. So as I work around this, you can see I'm really rolling the eraser. And I'm trying to be mindful of that sharp edge against a kind of a soft transition to create that rounded edge. So in order to create the illusion of that cloud being more rounded, it might have a sharper edge and then just be a little bit softer on that inside. And I'll just play around like just like that. You can see me just rocking that um, and letting it create marks and asking myself, are those marks the, the proper kind of scale and um, are they moving in the right direction to reference what I'm looking at? Not necessarily does it look exactly like what I'm seeing. I'm thinking more about the direction of the marks than anything. Kind of sculpting with it. Um, All right, Trisha, thank you. Homer Simpson smoking a pipe on the left. <laughs> I think it is. And that's perfect. So 
Uh, again, I'm not not worried about getting it perfectly right, but thinking in that area is this are the scale of the marks and the general direction, um, you know, are they generally in line with what I'm observing? And actually, I think I would want to switch to my kneaded eraser for the rest of this because those marks are just harder edged. And as we come down here, that those clouds are softer. Like on the bottom here, they, they're really kind of wispy. And I can kind of enhance that a little bit. And this, these are areas, and I think about this a lot in my landscape work when I'm, when I'm outside is, you know, I'm not, you know, the viewer is going to be looking at the, the image, you know, without the, the landscape being directly in front of them. They're not, they don't have anything to really compare it to. So I just, the biggest thing that's most, you know, what's most important is that the landscape is believable and in some way reflects my experience of being out in that, that place. The, um, and then I, I want it to somehow, somehow express and capture that specific place. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, I've gotten the, the proportions right, but the primary thing is, does it, is it believable? Does it convey a sense of looking? Is that something else that I think about? Um, I think I'd need to go a little bit darker in some of those areas to really refine it. So now as at this pass, I'm looking at some of the light areas that I've, uh, I've created and I'm, I, I wanna think about the turning edge as it rolls into the shadow side of whichever it is. So as I look at the form, I look at this, for example, the this outer edge needs to be a little bit harder. And then I soften into that form. So just make sure I'm clear about which direction I'm, I'm pulling, or pushing the eraser so that it rounds the form appropriately. Really interesting blending brush. All right, now I've got two. I'm going to go in and just a few small areas refine those edges. So I'm looking for the areas of darkest dark, kind of more the, those dark areas as negative space rather than positive space. I apologize if there's any focus issues with the camera. I realize I left it in autofocus, so <laughs> I normally have that on manual, so it stays focused on the drawing. Um, uh, Heather, these are Dynasty brushes, which I hadn't really heard of before, so I'm, I was really excited. Um, they, I believe they're an FM brush uh, brand. You can find it, FM brush. They also had what's called a reservoir brush that I'd never seen. It's like a, it's got this long, thin watercolor color brush, but at the base of it was a, was a, a rounded belly to hold um, ink and watercolor and it blew my mind. You can make these long, straight, thin lines. They go forever because that reservoir would hold it. Um, so right in here, again, I'm looking for those darkest darks, and I'm more thinking about, again, the direction of my marks in, to, in a way that will kind of reinforce the, the way that cloud is billowing more than anything. And even if it's small and the viewer may not notice it right away, um, on some kind of finer level in their mind, they'll, they'll perceive that it'll resonate as having structure. I want to give this a little bit more of a, an edge here. Uh, 
So I might incorporate just a little bit of line work to define those edges. So rather than think about kind of outlining the forms, what I'm going to do is going to pop along that, that edge and where it feels like I could sharpen it a little bit more, like right in here, I'm going to drop a little bit of a line. So I'm playing with this drawing a little bit more than I anticipated. The first study I did was kind of sketchier, um, but I found myself refining this a little bit more than I anticipated anticipated, which is fun. That's part of what reacting to the drawing means, or, or see what the, the artwork is telling you to do. I remember artists talking like that, and I had no idea what they were talking about. Just took a little bit more practice, and you start to start to get a feel for that. So I think what I'm going to do now is give, continue to give a little bit more variety in those clouds. So I'm just going to kind of misshape this eraser, going to make it lumpy. Um, find a good spot where it's got some good lumps. And just kind of roll along the form a little bit. Uh, so thinking still in terms of cross contour, you know, thinking about what that shape is of the cloud. I'm creating these irregular marks that add some more variety um, and hopefully feel more kind of naturally formed. And I think then, let's see, if, oh, right up here I want to... That was a little too much. A bit more here. All right, now I've got the white again. And maybe what I'll do is, is just bring a little bit more attention to some of the light here kind of radiating outward, catching this the edges of this this cloud here. Um, I'm going to start by focusing on the planes that are facing the, the brightest bright. And then if I need to, kind of let it trail off over the top. And as we work inside this form, it'll give that more structure as well. I'll give a little bit of a little bit of attention over here as well, um, and then maybe a little bit on the inner edge of that form. So I'm just touching in a few areas. I I want to make sure that each time I do it, I'm stepping back, looking at it, and analyzing it in relation to this here. I want to make sure that first where I've placed it makes sense and that it's not too intense because we have such dark forms here. If I go too bright here, it's going to, that light is really going to pop off. But I can allow that light to catch in just a few areas. And then here, this is above this, so then the strongest light, again, I want to be thinking about it, where it is relative to that. And just adding a little bit right here, and I think we're just about done. But it's a fun exercise. It's a great way, again, to be thinking about positive space, negative space, about value control, edges, all of these things that are really important. Add a little 
little bit more structure down in here. All right, well, I think I could keep working on this for a little bit, but I don't know if it's gonna make a substantive difference in this drawing. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I don't know what we're doing next week, but that's part of my plan is to try to figure it out because we meet every week at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. Um, you know, since we did largely a landscape today, I, um, you know, think about pivoting. Last week we did that uh, master copy of Van Gogh where we played around with the uh, skim milk as the as the um, fixative. Oh, I want to do a little bit of light down in here that catches that. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, Leslie, hopefully next week it'll be less messy. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, this one definitely got me. Isn't that fun? Yeah, but that's, that's typically the way I draw. I try not to do that when I paint because of pigments and chemicals and stuff and I try to use as, as natural uh, materials as possible so paints with only just straight linseed oil if I can but we got to be careful about those things um let's see all right thank you for positive comments everybody I hope your drawings turned out well if you are willing to share your work um, you'll find a link to the show page in the description below. I also pinned it to the top of the chat. I'd love to see your drawings. I'm always impressed and inspired by all of you who post your work and are willing to say, hey, this didn't turn out as well as I'd wanted, but here's what I did. Because that's what the show is all about. Because as artists, what do we do? We keep grinding. We keep doing the work. And most of the work is it's necessary for us to kind of move towards greater satisfaction and, and, and more accuracy in our execution. Um, but it's just part of the process. And we don't often see that. Often we'll go to a gallery show or go to a museum and we're seeing the best of the best. We're not seeing all the, the messes that were made along the way. Right? So um, let's go and make messes, experiment, play around, be willing to let this whole thing you know, fail but you'll always come away with something that you can learn from it. So if you move into a drawing with a certain amount of intentionality, it can really help you uh, grow quickly as an artist. So that's what this show is all about. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can look me up on uh, Instagram. Check out my book. Oh, that's right, right there behind it. Me, I've got the book, See, Think, Draw. It's available for pre-order. comes out in June. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, there should be a link in the description below. Ooh, the iguana, um, Jackie. Let me see if I can find a good one. I did start looking for a reference, um, so I'm going to keep thinking about it. I believe you sent one as well. So, um, yeah, and I apologize for difficulty posting on the site on Artist Network. Um, I'm keep, going to keep looking into it. What happens is that in order to prevent spam, we, we get spammed quite a bit. And in order to prevent that, what happens is that as you make a post, it has to be approved. And that's on me, but I was kind of out of pocket over the last week in a, in a convention um, with, with less than impressive internet speeds. <laughs> so it's very difficult to get in and do those things. So I was trying my best to catch up today. So that's on me, and I apologize. Um, I will do my best to try to get in there. I try to do that every day, get in and approve everybody's work, and hopefully it shows up. So um, I do want to thank you, those who, for those of you who have been persistent and continue to do that, though. I know it's been a challenge, and so that makes me doubly appreciative of those who continue to, to do that. So thank you. Have a fantastic week. We will see you next week. I will post next week's drawing as soon as I can. Um, so have at it. Have a great week.